Hey everyone, welcome back. Good afternoon. Just getting the stream underway, and um, in about three minutes, we will get the actual lecture started. So, I hope you all are doing well and having a good week to this point. And just hang in there for a few, and we will get right to the lecture in just a couple minutes. <clears throat> Hey, Tina, good to see you. How's it going? <clears throat> Mia, Maria, Nicholas, David, Moises. Hi, everybody. Hope you all are doing good. <clears throat> Hi, Sarah. Welcome back. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. Hi, Ruby, Angelina, Evan, AJ. Good to be with you guys. One second. I'm just going to grab myself a little um, soft drink. One second. Thanks. All right. Good afternoon, guys. Hey there. Gabby, Spencer, Ashley, Isaac, Anthony. Welcome again. Okay, just a few seconds here. Hi right there, Sylvia. Good to see you too. Okay, everybody, it's 2.30, so let's get started. Um, anybody here usually um, just as normal, go ahead and leave a comment whenever you have a chance, and then that'll make sure to note that you were present today. Um, okay, so let's see where we are at. We just have a couple of leftover notes to finalize the article by Peter Singer, Rich and Poor. Um, so we've been working on that article for a little while, and there's just a last small section of notes to cover. Um, other than that, <clears throat> I'm still working on finishing the grading of the essays that you guys submitted last week. Those I will be able to finish uh, Within this next week, definitely I'm targeting the weekend as the time when I have enough time free to finish the remaining few exams, sorry, essays that I'm still looking at. So um, over the weekend, just look out for a message through Titanium I'm going to send to the class notifying you that the grades are ready for those first essays. Once I send out the notice, then uh, it's like an invitation to any student to simply request their grade from me. And if you want, I'll tell you your grade and comments on the first essay. But I do just need a couple more days to finish them up. Anyway, um, no later than the end of the weekend, those will be done. Also, I'm going to send the study guide for the upcoming midterm exam this weekend. I think I'll send it on Sunday. <clears throat> so just know that on Sunday I'll probably have a couple of um, messages that I'll send to you through Titanium, knowing, notifying you of the great results of the first essay, uh, or at least that they are completed, so then you can request your grade, and also the study guide. We'll have that study guide with us, and then we're going to use it next Wednesday for our review session. So the upcoming dates are this. Today we're going to try and finish um, the writing of Singer and also Garrett Hardin. Then we're going to take our time with one more article by Judith Thompson. Maybe we'll be able to start it today. If it gets delayed into Monday, then we will just cover that article on Monday. 
I kind of thought that there could be a chance of some of the meetings pushing the schedule back. That's why I uh, dedicated two days to the uh, Judith Thompson article. So that means that if we can't get to it today, we still have plenty of time on Monday to do it. So yeah, um, one more article after we finish with Garrett Hardin. That's what we'll start on today. And then next Wednesday, it's a review session where we use the study guide and come together here in the meeting to talk about all the different study guide questions, get you as prepared as you can be for the test. And then you'll take the test on Monday. Um, what is that? Monday, March. Let me get the date. 22nd. Okay, so not next Monday, but the Monday after that. And um, the way that you'll submit that test, I mean, this is a little bit early for me to talk about it, but you just have to send me your document in the in, as an email attachment. Um, so you'll simply compose an email to me with your completed test questions uh, before the end of the class period. So it'll be just like a normal test that you would take any time. Uh, you have the dedicated window of time, 2.30 to 3.45. I'll, I'll deliver the test form to you just before 2.30, and then you'll have until 3.45 to read to send back your answers. Okay, so anyway, as we get closer to the spring break and the halfway point of the class, we have the midterm coming up. I'm finishing the grades on your first essay. They'll be done this weekend, and then you'll also get your study guide. Okay, and so just letting you know about those couple of things. This is all in the syllabus, and this is all according to schedule, but just to kind of remind us as we go through the, uh, through the, through the semester together. All right, and it's good to see everybody here. I see all you guys in the chat, so welcome back again. Um, as usual, if you ever have questions, comments, reaction to anything that we're doing in the class, please let me know and I'll be happy to um, help you out. Will the exam be all short answer questions? Well, they'll all be written answers, yes, so there's not gonna be like multiple choice or you know, circle the right word or something. It, you'll have to write written answers. I don't know when you say short what I should tell you because I don't want people to think that like a sentence is enough. Um, you should just give the most thorough and detailed answers that you can. And you're not going to be asked to report on a ton of questions, but you're going to get a long list of possible test questions. So the study guide will contain all the possible questions. And therefore, you can already have your notes and um, review ready as we get into the test itself. I, I guess a normal question answer could take a, a paragraph, maybe a couple paragraphs. Different students have different levels of detail and concision when they write. So um, the main thing is to just be thorough and accurate and to say everything that's relevant to the question that you know from the book and from our notes in the class lectures. So I don't know, like for example, if I ask someone, explain Anselm's ontological argument, a good answer would be something like, Anselm's trying to prove that God exists. He says that everyone has the same definition of God, greatest conceivable being. There are some things that only exist in the mind, like a unicorn. There are other things that exist in the mind and in reality, like the White House. Well, it's greater to exist in both. So if God's definition is the greatest conceivable being, then he would not be the greatest conceivable being if he didn't exist in both the mind and in reality. Therefore, given the definition and the claim that it is greater to exist in both, he must exist in both. Therefore, he's real. You know, like you'd have to summarize the argument and just explain it as though you were teaching it to somebody, like I'm teaching it to you. But that's basically it. So the questions will be scored on a zero through four point scale. So it's not like just all or nothing, you got it or you didn't get it. There's levels of accuracy and detail. So it could be four, three, two, one, or zero, depending on how good the answer is. You want to try and obviously reach for a four, be fully explicit, fully detailed, and just give the answer. But anyway, there's more to say on this, and you're going to have a lot more to say on it next week after we have the study guide and once we're getting into the review session. So on Sunday, no later than that, I'll send you the total full study guide, and then we'll be ready for the test. Okay, good question. So if we're all ready to go then, let me just take us back one more time into the writing of Peter Singer. What we had done last time is we had gotten all the way to the end of his essay except for one thing. We didn't get to talk about his responses to these objections against his argument. So in the big picture, he's arguing that we have a moral obligation to assist the third world poor that live in absolute poverty and are starving and dying. He says that's because there's over a billion people in the world that don't have the means necessary to provide for basic necessities like food, clothing, and shelter. And in the first world, people like us have more than enough wealth and income to provide for those same basic needs. So if we diverted some of the surplus wealth that we would otherwise spend on just luxuries or non-essential expenses to the third world for the sake of reducing global poverty, that we could um, prevent some death that's uh, you know a bad thing and we could do that without making major sacrifices or harming our own best interest that much. Um, <clears throat> the full argument that he ends up giving after he discusses differences between killing and failing to assist and why in the end, it's still bad to fail to assist, even if killing is worse. He lays out the argument for the obligation to assist. 
The argument goes like this. If you can prevent a bad thing without making a comparable sacrifice, then you should. Absolute poverty is bad. And we can prevent some without making major sacrifices. So therefore, we should prevent some absolute poverty. And he gave the case of the drowning child example to try and drive home the point that when life and death is on the line and you can prevent death and the sacrifice necessary to prevent it is nothing huge and it certainly isn't on the level of a person dying, then he thinks that would be a moral obligation like in the case of saving a child from drowning, even if you had to ruin your clothes to do it. Um, so then we got to those objections, guys. And that's where we ran out of time. I'm going to write the names of the objections one more time on the board. And then I'm just briefly going to run through how Peter Singer tries to defeat the objections to his own argument. Okay. So he gave his argument. We've got to assist the poor. Here's why. Then he ran through some objections that critics may say. Like, here are some of them. Objections to his argument. Singer's obligation to assist argument. But some of you guys maybe remember the names of these objections. What's one of them? Taking care of our own. We talked about four of these objections. Taking care of our own. Um, <clears throat> property rights. Leaving, leave it to the government. And then finally, uh, triage. So I... Explain these objections last time towards the end of the class lecture, so I'm not going to take a ton of time to review them, but just briefly. Taking care of our own is the idea that, no, I'm not obligated to assist the international third world poor. If I have moral obligations to care for any persons, it's not that widespread of a group. It's just my own, who I, who I should be obligated to take care of, meaning maybe my own family, my own friends, or maybe the citizens in my own country that are starving or suffering in poverty. I don't know about starving, but, you know, Homeless, at least. Not to worry. Good to see you, Summer. Um, so that's one objection against his argument that says, no, I don't have to help the poor because I only really have to help my own. Another objection is property rights. A person may argue, no, I am not obligated to assist the international poor because that's like saying I have an obligation to give up some of my wealth, which is my property. But since I have the right to do what I wish with my property, include to, including withholding on it or spending it on frivolous or even self-destructive things, to be honest. Since I have the right to do whatever I wish with my income and wealth, since it's my property, I cannot be told that I'm obligated to give some of it over for the cause of the poor. Okay, another objection leading into the government. Someone might say, it's not the obligation of individual private citizens to aid the poor. If any one or thing should help, it should be uh, the state, the government as a whole, because um, then the funding mechanism would be more reliable and consistent. There would be a greater source of revenue to draw from by the taxpayer's income. And, um, you know, so isn't that a better alternative to just leaving it to individuals? And another objection was triage. Triage was the point that um, when you have a mass casualty emergency or an overwhelmed influx of injured or sick patients in a medical system, and then you don't have enough medical resources to care for all of them at, at first, you have to make tough decisions about how to ration care so that um, you can make the most um, life-saving impact with the shortage of medical resources that you have. So in triage, suppose you have a population of people sick, injured, or whatever, they would be divided into three groups. The group that's too injured to really realistically help, even if you tried. The group that's injuries or illnesses are so minor that they're probably going to survive even if they don't receive attention. And then the critical middle group, who are people that would probably die if they got no help and would live if they got help. Um, so according to the thought of triage, we should not help the people in the most grave condition of need because if they're a lost cause, then that's a waste of these precious and limited resources. So in a similar way, a person could argue, let's not help the poorest of the poor because that won't really help fix the problems of global poverty and hunger and may in fact even just make the group larger, setting us up for bigger problems in the future. Okay, so those are the objections one last time. Now, how does Mr. Singer reply back to them? This is the last piece then to know. Because remember, if you're keeping your eye on the big picture, Singer is no fan of these objections. These are objections against him, so his argument anyway. Uh, so how does he reply and defend his argument against the objections? That's the last thing to say. So I'm going to talk you through that. First of all, taking care of our own. He has two things to say back to that. One thing is this. Um, how far away a person is or how close they are in terms of their physical distance from you 
that he does not see as a morally relevant factor in terms of what your obligations are respective of that person. Um, so basically, if there's a sick, starving, dying child and they're in your immediate environment, you'd feel the obligation to take some kind of action to help them, at least calling the ambulance and getting them to a ICU, right? If you saw a kid on the street that looked like a skeleton, like, like in the plains of West Africa, I'm sure that you would not be indifferent to that event and just say, hmm, skeleton looking kid, that's different. You'd probably at a minimum want them to get some attention. So there are, kill there are all kinds of children that are like that in the third world and just, you know, middle-aged people, adults, teenagers, all ages. But why is it that we would only have the feeling of an obligation to respond when someone's in our face, like close by to us in terms of physical proximity? He doesn't see that as relevant. Just because some of these poor people we're talking about are in the third world and they're out of sight, out of mind, as they say, that doesn't mean that they don't really exist. So he doesn't see how, how close or far away from you geographically, why that really matters to your feeling of moral obligation to other human beings. He also says this in reply to that objection. When you say taking care of our own, if you're like a first world citizen like us, Americans, well, your own don't really need much taken care of. They're pretty much doing fine. You know, in the first world, people don't have huge desperate needs, like I'm going to starve to death or something. So um, he says, how can you prioritize the less urgent needs of your own family, friends, and fellow citizens over the life and death needs and struggles of people in the third world? Doesn't that get the priority backwards? You're, you're taking care of, you know, basically um, trivial needs over urgent life and death needs and saying that those are the ones that you're going to take care of first. The last thing he says is this. Um, not only are the needs not on a par, not only is it kind of arbitrary to assign moral obligation based on how close or far away someone is geographically. But he also says, um, if you only care about people that are members of your own country or your own, how is that any different, he says, than people who say the following? I only care about people who are my own. And when I say my own, I mean people who look like me. In my case, that would be like saying, I only care about fellow white people, right? And whoever says such a thing as this, we already know that that's biased, discriminatory, um, racist, right? And so we don't show favor for people who say, I only care about my own, and I mean my own race. So how does he, he says, how is that any different from saying, I only care about my own, and I mean my own fellow nation and my members of my country? There's no more principled basis to draw the circle of concern around your race as opposed to your nation or something. And so he thinks neither one is legitimate. Okay, so next to the property rights objection and how he replies back to that. He says, okay, in a way, yeah, it's true that you do have your property rights. And so that does give you the permission and the right to withhold on aid if you don't want to give it. Legally speaking, of course, you can't be compelled to give money if you don't want to against your will. But he says the question is not whether you have the right to not give money. We already know that. The question is whether that's good or bad morally. And so what he's saying is there's more to life in terms of being a good moral person than to just living according to what you have the right to do. In other words, not everything that you have the right to do is a good thing that you ought to do, right? For example, let's go into this question. Um, do you agree with me that you have every right to drop out of college today? If you really don't want to do this anymore and you're just done with taking classes, um, do you feel that you have the right to stop school? Like, is that your right if you really wanted to? Easy question, but let me see in the chat. What is your thought on that? You have the right to drop out. Yeah, you do. You're an adult. And, you know, I guess you could choose to do that if you really want. But you follow me? Like, is that what you should do? I don't think so. I think you should see your education through and, and get your degree and all the great things that come with it. But um, just because you have the right to drop out, you understand? That doesn't mean that you should or that it's a good idea. So he says, Peter Singer says, just because you have the right to not give money because it's your money and you don't have to give it if you don't want to, that doesn't answer the question whether it's good or bad for you to withhold on the aid. Because you have the right to do all kinds of things that are not smart. Do I have the right, if I want today, to go buy a Rolex watch and then smash it with a hammer on this table? Yeah, if I bought the watch, it would be my property, and so I could destroy my property, and no one could tell me not to because it's mine. But would that be good? Would that be a, a, a wise decision? It would be totally foolish and self-destructive, but I guess I have the right to do it. So what he says about this is, fair enough, you have the right to not give money because the uh, income and wealth is your property. But we're not talking about whether you have the right to do that or not. We're asking whether you should, on a moral basis or not, withhold on the aid. And that, he thinks, you cannot justify. I mean, you have the right to walk around in public wearing a chicken suit, you know, but is it a smart thing? Is it a wise choice? It's kind of strange. It doesn't have much value. Um, so making the case that you have the right to not give money 
is not the same thing as saying, by the way, it's not good for you to give money. Um, and furthermore, on this point, he says this. He knows that he's writing this paper to an audience of readers that are like Western people. They're mostly going to be Christians because most people in the West are Christian, right? So he says, if you if you make this objection to me, how could you really be a Christian, he says, because if you follow the principles of Christianity and the teachings of Jesus and the scriptures from the New Testament especially, take a look at what those scriptures say. It never says, hey, the poor people, they're not working hard enough. Forget them. Just take care of yourself and your family. You know, the winners win, the losers lose. It's survival of the fittest. That's not what it says in the Bible. It says the meek shall inherit the earth. You should be your brother's keeper. It's harder for a wealthy man to enter the kingdom of heaven than for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle. And that's just the tip of the iceberg in terms of these kind of sentiments scattered all throughout the Bible. So he says, there's something that's not consistent between a person saying, I believe in Christianity and the teachings of Christ. But by the way, forget the poor people. They need to get their own help, their own money. And it's not my business to take care of them. So love thy neighbor. Another example. Yes, Spencer. So that's his response to this property rights stuff. Yeah, you have the property rights, just like I have the property rights to go to Vegas and put all my savings on one bed on a roulette table. But just having the right to do something is not equivalent to saying, yeah, it's a good idea. And also, if you profess belief in Christian scripture, then it really kind of runs contrary to the idea that you don't care about the poor and you don't think that it's your obligation to help them. Okay, so next is leaving it to the government. Um, for me anyway, you know, because I've taught this article so many different times, I've always kind of thought about how me personally and a lot of us that are in this meeting and, you know, are, are subject to the criticism that he's making <clears throat> because some of us, of course, don't give money to charity, as he says, we have a moral obligation to do. And so um, I get, I do give some money to the environment. Like I, I've been a donor to Greenpeace for many years. I give like 20 bucks a month because I think it's important to support the ecosystem and the environment. Right. But I don't yet have any kind of, charitable giving that I'm setting up for uh, for hunger reduction, global poverty, and so forth. Not that I don't believe in it, it's just that I haven't done it yet. I don't know. So when I think how would I justify my uh, behavior to a person like Singer, I sometimes think of this type of objection. You know, um, it's not that the aid is a bad idea, but shouldn't the state do it? And that way we're all invested into it. Well, anyway, Singer has, I think, a pretty so a solid reply to that way of thinking. Here's what he says, and it's pretty simple. He just says, why not both, though? You know, leaving it to the government, okay, the government could do more and probably should, but how is that uh, mutually exclusive with saying people as individual citizens should be willing to give more of themselves as well? The two things are not incompatible. In fact, they're mutually reinforcing. So government aid to the poor, individual charitable donations, more is better. So he just doesn't see the basis for saying leave it to the government, let people give as well. And also, the government's less likely to impose upon us a tax burden that we don't seem to be willing to impose upon ourselves through our charitable donations that we could deduct in our tax filings. So it's likelier to reach the outcome of the government doing more if private citizens were to be more generous. Finally, about triage, okay? If you remember triage, as I was just saying, it's when we would not be wise to help the poorest of the poor, just like in medical triage, it's not wise to help the most sick or injured persons when you have a scarce available medical resources to provide for everyone. So what Singer thinks is that with triage, the critic is basically focused on the fact that you might be over, you might be feeding into the overpopulation of the third world by sending that money and aid to the poorest of the poor that would otherwise starve. And that might be argued to artificially inflate the population size of those parts of the world who rely on the provision of international aid. Um, and at some future time that will become unsustainable as they continue to get too numerous. Well, Singer says if your worry is overpopulation in the third world and feeding into it by means of aid, there's a more humane alternative, he says, to hoping that the death rate would increase by withdrawing aid. And this more humane alternative would be to hope that the birth rate could decrease, um, and that can actually be achieved, as research has shown, through the provision of international aid in the form of contraceptive access for women, educational um, assistance, for the citizens of that country so that people can make more educated and wise family planning decisions and farming and machinery and food aid as well. So <clears throat> he says, why not try to provide aid that would help these countries reach a higher standard of living and thereby to bring their birth rates down. When birth rates decline, fewer people come into the world, but not because they are dying, just because no one has chosen to conceive the children in the first place. So he says triage involves a certain evil, 
allowing people to die off by neglecting their needs um, by withholding on aid. If we want to slim the population of the third world to make this problem less um, unmanageable, then wouldn't decreasing birth rate by means of international uh, assistance be a better alternative to that? Okay, so that's kind of how he rests his case. He thinks he's done a solid job of pushing back on all the big objections to his argument. And so, you know, he closes, uh, he closes that argument right there. So we're done all then with Peter Singer. Okay, guys, I wanted to talk you through the replies to those objections. But now it's time to turn the page to the other side of this whole debate, because as everything in philosophy, there's always uh, arguments and objections. So not everybody agrees with Singer's view that we have a moral obligation to assist the third world poor. In particular, this author has a totally opposite opinion and argument. So let's get into him. This is Garrett Hardin. Garrett Hardin. Um, so he lived from 1915 until 2003. And um, this is a paper of his that comes to us from 1974, and it's got a kind of almost cinematic title. It's got one of those titles where there's a colon and then like a subtitle. So here it is, Lifeboat Ethics, colon, um, the case against helping the poor. Okay, there you see the title, the author, his lifespan, and then the date that it was published. Lifeboat Ethics, the case against helping the poor. So he's really holding nothing back in the title. You can see right away what he's trying to do. He's going to make the case against helping the poor, that we don't have that obligation. And here's why he's going to lay out the reasons why he thinks we don't have the obligation to help the poor. Okay, so um, let's see. I just to flip my notes to that. Okay, so... Uh, <clears throat> The first thing that Garrett Hardin does in his paper is he he tries to attack a metaphor that was popular at the time among environmentalists of his day. And let me just give you a little window into the context. Environmentalism and the whole sustainability movement, environmentalist movement, it really started to grow by leaps and bounds in the latter portions of the 20th century and of course to, through to the current day. Um, in the 60s and 70s especially, interest in this issue starts to really pick up because um, it's only really in the mid 20th century that we start to see more significant impacts on the environment and the ecosystem from human activity. You know, for, for many years as human civilization took time to develop industrialized mechanistic processes, uh, the impact of human behavior on the world was much more hard to notice. I mean, it's not like people that were just living in rural and agrarian lifestyles without um, factories and um, uh, carbon emissions and um, fuel sources that generate that kind of pollutant uh, side effect. It's not like that has always existed. So for the bulk of human history, um, people might have been reasonable to think that humans could never do much to damage the planet Earth because it's just this endless bountiful supply of resources and there's not enough people doing enough stuff to harm it. But when we get deeper into the 20th century and you see the converging effects of overpopulation in the world, a lot of um, industrial waste and carbon emissions, we start to see more serious impacts on the quality of the environment, the quality of the air, the water, the level of forestation there is, uh, the dying off of certain species and global warming and melting of ice caps and on and on it goes. So in the 70s, environmentalism starts to rise to uh, social consciousness as a bigger deal. And so some of those early environmentalist writers in the literature were, fan were fans of a metaphor that they thought would help uh, make people more aware of the situation. And they would call this the, uh, the spaceship earth metaphor. Okay, so, but Garrett Hardin dislikes the spaceship earth metaphor. And I'll tell you why. But let me first just put that on the board so we all can see the point clearly. So first thing he kind of does is he says, I don't like that metaphor. Hardin dislikes the quote-unquote spaceship earth metaphor of environmentalists of his day. And so now it's time to explain what the metaphor is and then why does he not like it. Okay. So the metaphor is basically this concept. We are told, think of the planet Earth 
as like a big spaceship that we're all part uh, passengers on. Now, um, it's kind of an interesting metaphor because it's true, I guess, in a way that uh, we are all on the planet and it is in space and it's a big ball floating around in space orbiting the sun. So I guess in a weird way, you could sort of think of it as like this vessel that we travel through the universe on. And okay, if it's Spaceship Earth and we're all passengers on this one big vessel or you know vehicle, whatever you want to think of it as, spaceship, then it's kind of like a call for us to recognize that we share life together on this one planet. It's our only home. And if that's the case, then it's we should all share the resources and not use waste or destroy more than our fair share. So it's a call for sharing of resources, for uh, moderation in our consumer and consumption habits. Um, it's basically like, again, no, no individual nation or institution has a right to more of these resources than is their fair share. If it's a spaceship Earth and we all kind of live on it together, then we should share it and equitably distribute those resources. So that's the spaceship Earth metaphor. Don't overuse the resources. Don't destroy too many of them because it's our only planet. We're all on the spaceship together, so we should take care of it so we can survive and thrive into the future. That's the metaphor. It's a nice metaphor, I think, but Hardin is not a fan of it. And here I'll tell you why he does not like it. So he says this. The spaceship met Earth metaphor sounds nice, but he thinks if we took it seriously and we lived according to these principles that the metaphor advances, then it would uh, establish what he calls self-destructive or even suicidal policies for the sharing of global resources. He, he thinks that that would um, deprive the accumulated wealth from the more prosperous nations. And when that is redistributed throughout the world for a more equitable distribution, it would destroy these beacons of prosperity that are seen as like hope and opportunity for the less favored nations or the less prosperous ones or less fortunate, right? Um, so he thinks that the sharing of such resources would, it, it, it would be um, self-destructive uh, and it would undermine the ability of people to attain such wealth, even in more limited cases, not just in the most wealthy countries. Um, for an example, to kind of make the point more relatable, um, suppose you had a big house which has a bunch of additional bedrooms that are not being used. So it's like a four bedroom home and it's just like you and maybe one other person to live there. So you've got guest bedrooms that nobody currently stays in because it's a nice big house. Now, of course, if that's the case, you've got a spare room that no one's using. But uh, as you know, there's like homeless people out there in society that don't even have a roof over their head and they're just sleeping in the open air. So suppose that you came back to one of these nice big houses and you're the owner. Uh, and when you come back home, you see a homeless person or something that's already in your house just chilling on the couch. Now imagine that you say to them, get out of here. You're trespassing. You're not allowed to be here. This is my house. But imagine the person comes back and says, well, you know, I know it is your house, but it's your property or whatever. But when you really think about it, it's not fair because you have like three or four bedrooms that no one's even sleeping in. Meanwhile, I'm sleeping on a park bench just out in the street. How is that fair? I have nowhere to sleep and you have rooms that no one's using to this property of yours. You know, I have a right. You should share it. You should share these resources with me. Um, probably most of us, I guess you would think, would say um, I have such a tough time in life, but, you know, this is my property and I have even if it's an inequitable distribution of resources in the world. So the same kind of principle applies to the spaceship Earth metaphor. He says the sharing of resources implies that we all have an equal right to an equal share of the world's resources, but we don't. Um, there's a justification for the unequal access and distribution of global resources. And to those of us that hold the more prosperous uh, status, um, it would undermine our, our standing and our prosperity to, to, to agree with the metaphor. So another reason he does not like the metaphor is this. He says if this was truly a spaceship Earth, like the metaphor indicates, then it would have to have a captain because a ship that's out in the sea can't just be floating around with no one directing its course. It has to have a captain and some central authority that directs it. But that's not seen on the planet Earth. We do not have a global sovereign authority. We just have a bunch of individual sovereign nations which, with their own heads of state, right? But we don't have like a president of the planet Earth. He talks about how there is the United Nations, but it's not, in his view, a true international leader or authority because it doesn't have the power to advance or um, it doesn't have the power to enforce its mandates except through the member agreement of the nations that enter into treaties at the United Nations. So without a true international like captain of uh, planet Earth, he thinks that further weakens the force of the spaceship Earth metaphor. So. 
he says there's a better metaphor that he would like the reader to uh, apply to our circumstances. And so he says, I've got something different than the spaceship Earth metaphor. Let's go instead with Hardin's metaphor, he says, of the lifeboat scenario. So we're going to talk now about his whole lifeboat example. Um, clearing the board, create room for that. <clears throat> so he, you know how Peter Singer used certain statistics about um, poverty and wealth to construct his argument, talking about, you know, um, how many people live in the world without enough income or wealth to meet the basic needs of food, clothing, and shelter. Um, well, Hardin also wants to make use of certain statistical data to advance his counter argument or his own different argument. So he, he tells us about this. Two thirds of the world's nations are poor. So that's the majority, obviously, two thirds, two out of three. And one third of the world's nations are, by comparison, wealthy. With the United States, the wealthiest of all, right at the top of the wealth pyramid. So we are in that minority category of being a wealthy nation. One third wealthy, two thirds poor. So he says now, imagine this, this example. Suppose that we uh, say each wealthy nation is symbolized by a lifeboat floating around in the ocean. Okay, so here I'll just draw you a picture so you have a visual. This is a lifeboat, and it's Lifeboat USA. It's around, floating in the ocean, and who's that? It's you and me and all the others. Who are the people on the boat? Those are the citizens of the United States. And for each wealthy nation, there is a lifeboat in this metaphor that stands for it, that symbolizes it. So there's Lifeboat USA, which I get, <clears throat> sorry, which I guess because we're the wealthiest nation of all, this is the nicest, most... Um, well-equipped, sturdiest lifeboat out there. But you've also got lifeboat France, Germany, Britain, Japan, you name it, other first world industrialized economies. So that's part of the metaphor. You've got boats, they're lifeboats. The passengers are the citizens. The, the lifeboats stand for the wealthy countries. Now, he adds a couple of other characters to the scenario. There's also people in this example in the water. Here they are. Okay, people out there in the water, and um, <clears throat> the people in the water are like in a in a bad way. They're they're uh, threatened by drowning. They're having a hard time staying afloat. It's a constant struggle not to just succumb to the waves and drown. Um, and they're looking at us in these boats, thinking, "Man, it's nice up there. They're safe, secure, prosperous. Can they help us? Can they throw us a lifeline or do something? Because we're out here in the water, and it's terrible, and we're we're." fighting off death all the time. Okay, so he adds a couple of numbers to, to make the case even more um, parallel to the facts of poverty and wealth. He says, suppose that this lifeboat USA has 50 passengers on it and it has a total capacity of 60. So the number N of passengers here is 50 out of a maximum number of 60 that it could hold. Okay, so there's room still, I guess, spare room for 10 more. Suppose that out here in the water, though, you have got a 100 of the people in the water that are um, that are thrashing around, struggling to survive, and hoping for some kind of help from us here on the boat. Now, <clears throat> who do these people in the water represent? The, the global poor. And who do the people in the boat represent? As I said, the citizens of the first world nations, in this case, the United States. Now, notice how he's um, stipulated these numbers. 100 in the water, 50 on the boat. And that's supposed to parallel the relative ratio of uh, wealthy to poor nations globally, because we said it's two thirds poor, one third wealthy. And so if this is a sum of 150 people overall, two thirds are in the water, the poor people, and one third is in this boat. Let's say that's in this case, the lifeboat USA. So he says, all right, question then for anyone who's uh, hearing his essay or argument, what should we do then? If we're the passengers on the boat, the question is kind of like this. What should we do concerning those that are less fortunate, struggling to survive, and basically stuck there in that ocean water? What should we do for them, or if anything? One option is to take on all 100 that are out in the water and bring them on board. But, you know, if you have any kind of insight into how a narrative develops or how an argument builds up, I'm sure you can guess why he would raise this scenario or possibility. It's, it's simply so that he can knock it out of the park. Why do you think he says taking on all 100 would not be wise? Kind of easy enough to say, but maybe you can tell me in the chat. What, what is the basic reason that 
this author, Garrett Hardin, would say, taking on all 100 is, is not a good choice. What's the problem with taking on all 100? I mean, 100 people want help. You've got a boat. So bring them all on, and now they're not in the water. Isn't that good? Wh why or why not? Okay, yes, Summer, because if you did this, the boat would exceed its capacity and therefore would uh, be destroyed and would, would sink. And therefore, after the boat sinks, um, it can't provide for anyone, even the limited number that it had initially. So bringing on all 100, he says, is a recipe for failure of the boat. Um, it would overwhelm its capacity. It has room for 60. If you take 100, it's clearly overloaded. So these boat and the capacity thing, it's his like way of saying that any vessel or habitation that people use has a limited amount of resources um, to care for the group, right? Even a nation that's as powerful and wealthy as America does not have unlimited or infinite resources to care for all the people in the world that might need some help. So he says, um, trying to take all 100, even if it's done with the best noble intentions, you care about people and you don't want them to suffer, it would exceed the means of the boat to provide, it would cause it to fail, and that would be the total catastrophe for everybody. So one thing about Garrett Hardin, there's, there's lots of things that I have, uh, that I find fault with, okay? So I'm not exactly a huge fan of his argument, to be honest. But one thing that I'm not a huge fan of is at this stage of his essay, he sometimes slips into this, like, mode of making kind of almost, like, sarcastic, dark, critical humor of people that have a more humanitarian way of looking at things than him. Like, he kind of wants to needle people of that frame of mind as though you're so naive and so idealistic, come on, get real kind of attitude. And that I don't think helps his argument because it's just lapsing into rhetoric and it goes away from like just a, a clear and objective presentation of, of information. But at this stage this is what he says. It's like more of this rhetoric. He says, so are you one of these big, you know, bleeding heart type of people who you're like a, a big Christian who says, be your brother's keeper or you're like kind of the Marxist type who says to each according to their needs, what people need, that's what they should get. So if you have those kind of attitudes and it inspires you to take on all 100 and you think that's pure justice, then he says, ha ha, complete justice is a complete catastrophe. Like, like that's a little rhetorical aside, like, oh, you think you're being just, but in your well-intended righteousness, you're leading us to our destruction, right? Um, I don't know. I don't think that that helps his essay because it makes him seem a little more ideological than just... Um, philosophical or whatever. But yeah, he says, if that's complete justice, then complete justice is a total catastrophe. So we shouldn't have that. What's a different option, guys? Maybe don't take on all 100. But he presents us with option number two in a minute. And maybe you can guess where he's going to suggest we can take option two. So instead of bringing on all 100, clearly overwhelming the boat and causing it to fail, maybe we could do something else instead. What do you think could be a second possible option? If you're looking at the board, thinking of the scenario... Anyone have some thoughts? Just take some. That's right, Summer. Yeah. And, for example, maybe just take 10 because, as you've seen, the boat remains uh, not at capacity. There is room for 10 more. So why not just take 10? And then you've at least helped some people, maybe not everybody, and overwhelmed the boat, but it's better than nothing, right? Well, even there, uh, Garrett Hardin, very tough customer, says, no, I don't agree with even taking 10. And why not? Okay, he's got a few things to say. First of all, he says, how are you going to determine which 10? There's 100 there. Aren't the other 90 going to feel a little bit disappointed or that there's some kind of arbitrariness in the way that the other, nine, the other 10 were selected? In my view, though, that's not a very serious rebuttal because you can always design some type of mechanism for admitting people into the boat, whether it's a lottery or whatever. So anyway, suppose you invent some kind of mechanism by which 10 people can gain entry to the boat. What's wrong with that? Well, he says there's still something wrong. And the problem is that when you have the boat filled to its absolute maximum capacity, 60 out of 60, you eliminate this safety factor, which is usually important when you have any kind of room, vessel, or building. You don't necessarily want it to be filled to the absolute maximum capacity because then in case there's like the need for an orderly evacuation or some type of emergency, it becomes less safe. Um, so, for example, when you go into a public building sometimes, like a classroom or whatever, you'll oftentimes see a note that's on the wall from the fire marshal, and it says, like, maximum occupancy in this lobby or whatever, some certain number. And if you were in that type of room and an emergency needing, requiring an evacuation did happen, would you prefer that it be filled absolutely to that maximum number or that there was a little bit of spare room? In general, you would hope for it to have a little bit of additional wiggle room so that there would be less danger 
and greater security for those people that are there. So um, he says there's a cost to bringing on even 10. You eliminate that critical principle of the safety margin by having excess room. Let me pause for one second and say something that kind of annoys me about even this part of his argument. Why is he saying, okay, he talks about it's not wise to bring on 100 from the ocean in this, in this metaphor, or it's also not wise to even bring on 10. But I kind of feel like one thing that's confusing to me, I don't know if you felt this way as you read it, but um, bringing people onto the boat doesn't sound exactly like don't provide money or aid to the poor, right? Helping the poor can be uh, charitable donations of, mood, of food, money, or, or et cetera. This sounds more like he's railing against the possibility of admitting people into the country, like contrary to uh, permissive immigration policies. So it's sort of like, which one is it? Um, uh, you know, and it's also sort of like he he kind of blurs the lines between pushing back on permissive immigration policies versus pushing back on charitable aid being a moral obligation. So I sometimes feel like his examples start to get off the rails a little bit. Um, and oh yeah, you're saying that you could still throw out life rafts. Yeah, I guess um, it's a temporary solution, I suppose. But then we'd have to add something to his example that he didn't put in it. So I guess. Um, I'm not permitted to, to speculate on whether that's something he'd like to, to add. Um, but do you guys kind of know what I mean? Like, why are we talking about bringing people into the country as, as he says, we would overwhelm the country if we brought in all the people who need help? Nobody said, let all the third world poor come to America and live there. Um, so in my mind, it's kind of like it's, it's a bit rhetorical rather than really getting into the nuts and bolts of how the real world works and how it compares to the example that he's giving. But anyway... I know it's a metaphor for giving aid, for sure. Yeah, I know, Spencer, like your example, is, is a well-chosen kind of uh, amendment to his original case. For whatever reason, maybe because it doesn't benefit his conclusion, he just ignores that option. So he says, what's the best option? And it's very cold and, you know, in a way indifferent to the needs of those less fortunate. He says, how about just make sure no one can ever get on the boat and instead just diligently guard it against those that would board without permission? Um, he says that may seem to many people abhorrent. So he kind of takes on that attitude. He's like, some people are going to say that's, that's disgusting. That's despicable. Don't you care about people that are starving and suffering? And he says, it may seem abhorrent to some people, but it's the only option in his view that can ensure the continued prosperity and, uh, thriving of the people that are presently on the boat. Now he says, here's another one of those moments in the paper where he descends into this kind of sharp rhetoric against people that may be more sympathetic to the poor than him. He says, do you feel guilty? If you feel guilty that you're a passenger on the boat, you know, and here he says, you might feel this kind of guilt. I was just born on this boat, but it's not necessarily fair that just because of the accidental circumstances of my birth, I'm living in prosperity while other people through no fault of their own, just born in the third world are starving and struggling. So I don't feel like it's fair for me to just deny people any assistance or aid simply because of the accident of me being born where I was born. But he says this, he says, if you really felt that guilty about your good fortune to be on this so-called lifeboat, then you know what you could do? And I'm sure you can imagine what he's going to say next. It's one of these kind of love it or leave it things. If you feel so guilty to be one of these well-off, fortunate people on the boat, why don't you just swap places with someone that's out there in the water? The person who trades positions with you won't be guilty about their new good fortune. Otherwise, they wouldn't have agreed to do the swap. And then after a while, he says, if all the guilty members who have that guilty conscience kind of exchange their position with people on the outside, then we won't change the net number here. And eventually we'll purge the boat of all the guilty consciences so that eventually only the people that are there are people who feel good about it and don't have any degree of guilt. Once again, though, I would say this as I'm trying to give you a balanced viewpoint on his essay. Um, I also don't think that this corresponds to anything in reality. So it's, it's, an, it's another piece of pure rhetoric that doesn't match to a real world scenario. Because right, there's no policy that exists which says, hey, you can switch citizenship with a member of the third world if you're not happy with your American citizenship or with your prosperity. There's no such thing like, hey, let me do an exchange. I'll become a citizen of the third world and you can take my position. So it's like he says these things that make kind of sense in his metaphor, but they don't have any real application to the real world. So hypothetical scenarios are fine, but they become problematic when they start to deviate from any uh, way of comparing them to real world circumstances. So I mean, I find a little bit of fault with some of the things he says there. But anyway, with that basic metaphor in place, he continues to make his argument and he goes from there. So the next thing that he talks about are the differing rates of reproduction that exist in the first world versus the third world. 
Now, I would I would, I would ask you guys what you think based off of your prior knowledge or just your intuition. Where do you think that um, reproduction rates are higher where um, the doubling of population happens more rapidly? In the first world where people have more wealth or in the third world where people ha are poor? Again, the question is where do you think people uh, reproduce more rapidly where more babies get born per capita? In the first world or in poor nations? Where do you think more babies are being born? <clears throat> Just, just if you had to guess, you guys, it's kind of an either or, but there's a definite answer to this. It's, well, you say foreign, David, but uh, I guess the way to say it would be poor nations because relative to us, France is a foreign nation, but they're wealthy. You know what I'm saying? So like the distinction is between wealth and poverty, not just domestic and foreign. Right. So third world poor nations, they do reproduce much more quickly. And here's why. There's, there's a number of reasons why. But, um, okay, for one, in these parts of the world where there's so much poverty and hunger, uh, infant mortality rates are much higher. So sometimes people will have more children just to offset the possible losses that can occur in the first few years of life due to infant mortality. Another thing is that in these parts of the world where this kind of poverty prevails, women are less fully uh, socially equal to men. And that actually, studies show, results in them having less input into family planning decisions, and therefore that causes fa larger family sizes also. In addition, in many of these poor parts of the world, um, the norm is to have larger communal living situations so that everyone can contribute their slight bit of income or wealth to the cause of providing um, sufficient means for the, for the large communal household to survive. And therefore, in some cases, it's actually to the benefit of the household to have more members. Um, also, contraceptive access is not as reliable in many of these countries, especially in tandem with the fact that women don't have fully equal social standing in many of those places. So for all of these kind of converging reasons, many more children are born at higher rates in um, poor nations than in first world countries. And that in a way it's kind of, it is unfortunate because what it means is that in the parts of the world where there's the least capacity in terms of wealth and income to care for a large burgeoning population, that's where most of the reproduction is actually happening. And in the first world nations where there's more wealth and people actually have the greater ability to provide for children and a new generation of young people, there's fewer children being born. So it's kind of like the wires are crossed where people have more money, they're having less children. Where people have less money, they're having more children. But anyway, that's the case. And so <clears throat> Garrett Hardin knows that. And so he points it out to his reader at this point. What he refers to is the rate at which a population will double in size. And so wealthy nations, population will double. Population times two, and how long does that take in wealthy nations? It's a, a, approximately every 87 years. Okay, but poor nations are reproducing much faster than that, and the reproductive rate that leads to a doubling of population is approximately every 35 years. Okay, so <clears throat> it's over a factor of more than two to one, like in terms of how rapid. So take America today, which is 2021. 87 years from now is the turn, well, it's early in the next century, 2108. If we just do the math, right? That's 2021 plus 87. So in 2108, if this, um, you know, remains stable, if this rate of reproduction were to remain consistent and stable over that 87 year span, which is an open question, of course, because there is, after all, an upper limit how many human beings could possibly uh, live on the planet Earth. So we think that eventually um, there cannot be unlimited population growth, so eventually you'd think the number would change. But supposing that it remains the same, then if we have 300 million or so Americans today, which is roughly the number, then when will we get to 600 million? Okay, if this is to be believed, around the year 2108. But um, suppose then Hardin says this, Suppose that we set up an initiative today to give aid from 300 million American donors to 300 million um, members of the third world that are poor. Okay, so let's say there are seven nations which have an aggregate population of 300 million, and they're all very poor nations where all those people are extremely poor. So if we set up a program to give from American citizens in the first world to 300 million um you know, global um, citizens in the third world, 
What would be the ratio of donors to recipients on the first day today? It would be 300 million donors to 300 million recipients scattered throughout the third world. So it would be one to one ratio today. But would the ratio of donors to recipients remain one to one over an 87 year span? And I mean, if these numbers are accurate, then no, because think about it. We would start off today 300 million to 300 million. But then 35 years in, they've gone from 300 million to twice as many, 600 million. Then another 35 years, placing us at 70 years in, we've, they've doubled yet again from 600 million to 1.2 billion. And then since 87 years is 17 more than 70, that's halfway through a third cycle of doubling. So by the time we get to 600 million, they've gone and leapfrogged us in population, 300 to 600 million to 1.2 billion, now over perhaps 2 billion. So it starts off initially as a one-to-one -one ratio of donors to recipients. Because of the rapid reproduction rates in the third world, it becomes a much larger burden. It becomes more like one to four or even worse. So um, he says that even if it was well-intended, like a policy of sharing resources to help the global poor, what starts off as a manageable philanthropic load today becomes unsustainable as it increases this philanthropic burden over time. Um, so <clears throat> this is just yet another reason why he thinks uh, it would be unwise for us to think that we could actually help the poor through the global aid that we could give, because if we did it, we might just be feeding into the population overgrowth of those parts of the world, eventually making it unsustainable as the cohort gets too large to be pro adequately helped any longer. And then the withdrawal of such aid in the future would lead to a bigger dying off. It's kind of like the triage objection. It's just hammering home the one element of it that reproduction rates and population sizes are not the same in the first and the third world. One thing though I would say, just as a sort of sidebar right, really quick, at this stage of his argument, I, I, have, I find fault with something he's saying because he's helping himself to an assumption here that I don't think is fair. He says these poor nations are basically poor today, poor tomorrow, and poor forever. They will always be reproducing over twice as fast as us. So it's just not wise to try and assist unless you want to help fuel this runaway train of population explosion, which is part of the problem of global scarcity and hunger. But I don't agree with him because why should we, why should we accept his premise that a poor nation can never ever move to a higher standard of living? I mean, I would have thought that the whole point of providing such aid is to assist these countries in making movement to their own higher developed standard of living, at which time they would join the ranks of the developed nations and start reproducing slower in line with what we see in all the other first world countries. So, I mean, his argument here kind of only works if you just charitably assume, as he wants you to, that the wealthy nations and the poor nations are kind of static in their economic future outlook. The poor nations have no, uh, like, opportunity or possibility, according to the way he's thinking, to make movement into a higher tier of uh, second or first world developed nation status. But that's where I find, you know, that that's totally baseless. I mean, why would we think that every nation has potential to um, make economic and social progress? So I think he's kind of just being a little bit uh, kind of uh, cynical in his assumptions about what poor nations could ever be. But anyway, that's one thing to say on the side. So then next up, he talks to us about a concept that he's well known for in his writings. Probably the, the idea that Garrett Hardin is most well known for, his sort of like academic legacy he left behind, is this concept that's called the tragedy of the commons. So let me tell you about the idea of the tragedy of the commons, because that's what he speaks about next. Okay, so the tragedy of the commons is just this concept which says that public resources inevitably fail. And according to the thought, they fail for two basic reasons, because of over-utilization, overuse, and then poor upkeep, poor management, poor maintenance. All right, so let me write that here. Public resources uh, inevitably fail, they're destined to fail, they're doomed. Why? Due to um, uh, overuse and poor maintenance, unlike, unlike private resources. Okay, so public resources, he says they fail, and why? Because of these things, overuse, poor maintenance, and that's different from private resources, which don't have that, those problems. So um, 
he gives an example to make the point. He says, imagine this hypothetical, okay? Suppose there's one acre of farmland. So this is an acre of farmland that can be used by farmers to have their animals graze uh, on the acre. Suppose that this one acre of land is opened up to the public, okay? So it becomes a public resource, meaning that it's a resource, but anyone can use it. It's not restricted to some private entities or private um, parties. So whoever has farm animals and wants to come through, they can just come and use this acre. It's open to the public. So what would happen, he says, if that were to happen? Well, who would come to the acre to bring their farm animals and let them graze there? Everybody would. Why wouldn't they? Because there's no reason not to. If it's open to the public, then you have access to it, and um, there's no restrictions on it. So if it's there, you would, would you'd use it if you could make use of it. So that is going to lead to the following. You're going to have an overload of people bringing too many farm animals to this one acre, overgrazing the land, and then basically ruining it so it's no longer productive or um, useful for anybody. Also, when these people bring all their influx of farm animals to the public acre, are they going to do their best to clean up after themselves and tidy up and sustain it for the future? Probably not, because why would they? It's not their property. It's something that is public. So if it goes to ruin and it's overutilized and poorly upkept, then it's not like they lose the value of a personal investment. And it's also not that it reflects poorly on the individual uh, members of the public that utilize the public resource. So it's a recipe for failure, basically. If you open it to the public, everyone uses it, so it's overused. Nobody takes care of it, so it's poorly maintained. And then it just becomes something that's ruined, and now no one can get it. No one can benefit from it. Well, what if the one acre was private, though? Okay, In that case, would the private owner, he or she, or they, would they, um, would they allow the one acre to become overgrazed with too many animals? Of course not, because if you own it and you're the private owner, you don't want to lose the value of the investment that you've already put some of your wealth into, right? So you have every vested interest in not allowing it to be overutilized or to poorly maintain it. Because if it falls into disrepair or ruin, you've lost the value of your initial investment. And it also reflects poorly on you as the owner. I don't know. I think about sometimes public versus private restrooms when I teach this lesson, because at least for, I don't know, guys using public restrooms, uh, they're oftentimes quite dirty, you know, they're oftentimes, you know, people leaving the faucet running, throwing paper towels on the floor, and that just is the tip of the iceberg in terms of how gross some of these bathrooms could be in public. But when you go to a private restroom at, like, someone's house, usually they wouldn't do that, right? Just throw, like, toilet paper on the ground or, you know, um, make a mess. And why not? Well, because <laughs> they have to live with it. It's theirs. And if it becomes disgusting and messed up, then they're ruining their own bathroom. And not only that, it reflects poorly on them as an owner when it is that disgusting. So basically, people that own resources and they're privately owned want to take care of them, and they don't want to ruin them for future use. But when it's a public resource, everyone wants to use it, but no one has a matching feeling of obligation to sustain it. And therefore, it gets overused, poorly maintained, and it gets ruined. So this is the idea of the tragedy of the commons, and why does he mention this now? Okay, He says it because he's trying to warn us and advise us against um, – supporting public resources, including the World Food Bank. So that's kind of the target of his attack here. The World Food Bank is a humanitarian program that was kind of new when he wrote this back in the 70s, but now it's been around for a long time. And the food, the International Food Bank, the World Food Bank, is a system whereby wealthy nations will contribute food and aid to it according to what they have as a surplus, and poor nations will draw from the World Food Bank according to their needs. So it's supposed to be like, you know, we just established this, all the world's wealthy nations give some kind of contribution, and it helps to at least provide some aid and assistance to the third world. Well, why doesn't he like it? Because he says it's just another commons. It's a commons which will once again inevitably fail due to overuse and poor maintenance. And here's how that would happen in this case. Uh, the poor nations would draw from the World Food Bank because it's there for all of them to draw from. So they would definitely use it. But they wouldn't do anything to... Um, wean themselves off of it in the long term by becoming um, economically self-sufficient on their own. So he thinks that they would draw from it, exploiting the access they have to it, and continue to reproduce at these inflated rates until such time as we have an unsustainable status quo where too many people exist in the third world that have too much need and there's no longer the adequate resources to provide for it. Um, so he says, think of the World Food Bank as yet another commons. It may be something that you feel good about supporting because it's a humanitarian idea, but he says in the end, it's bound to fail because it's, you know, the logic of the 
sort of economic argument that he makes here. Other examples of the tragedy of the commons that I think are at least somewhat reasonable are like water and air pollution, right? Nobody owns the water of the world, you know, the oceans and lakes and stuff, they're just there. And so some people feel like that gives companies free reign to just pollute those waters because it's not privately owned. So they take advantage of the world's waters, use them and poorly maintain them. Same with air, right? Nobody owns the air uh, on this planet, it's just there. But because of that, some people think that pollutant emitting companies feel free to just spoil the air quality with all of their emissions. Um, and of course, make a profit off of the sale of whatever good or service that they generate through those uh, industrial processes. So I don't know if that means that according to Hardin, we should privatize ownership over air and water. I think that would have its own problems, but you know, this is the kind of idea that he lists out when he tries to promote the idea of the tragedy of the commons. Okay. So, um, he says that sometimes the real beneficiaries of humanitarian initiatives like the World Food Bank are special interests in big businesses. He says that rail and shipment companies, which have to transport the food and stuff from point A to B in, in, in order for the World Food Bank to operate, that they have a vested interest in the perpetuation of these schemes because they can profit off of the taxpayer-funded uh, kickback that they get for, for staffing and running those operations. Also, he says that the administrators who staff the bureaucracy, who runs these programs, would have a vested interest in perpetuating its existence because that pays their checks, even if it didn't necessarily help the poor people in the long run. Um, and, you know, he tries to take on a few objections, but I think he does a pretty poor job, in my opinion, of replying to the objections that he mentions. In one case, he refers to this Chinese proverb, maybe some of you have heard it, that it says, um, give a man a fish, he'll eat for one day, but teach a man how to fish and he'll eat forever basically because now he has the skills to get his own fish. And he says, some people might reply to my whole argument by saying, well, if food is the issue and you're just worried about giving people food so that they can just continue to reproduce at these ex excessive rates, why not rather give like technological and educational assistance so those nations become more self-sufficient on their own and have better ability to provide for themselves independently? I think that's a great objection, but for some reason he doesn't seem to like take it very seriously. He just says, nope, if you do that, you know, if you give them even technological and educational assistance instead of literal food aid, you're still going to set them up for population overgrowth and that's gonna just set them up for a bigger fall in the future. But I can't understand why he has said that because to me, I would have thought that specifically when you give educational and technological assistance, you're trying to bring these countries up to a higher developed standard of living. So why would we expect that they should continue to reproduce at these excessive rates, which are characteristic only of the poorer nations. I don't know. Again, I think he kind of runs up against this problem that I was pointing out earlier, where he has no optimism about the ability of poor nations to reach a higher standard of living. But I mean, if we're all human beings, then unless you have some kind of weird assumptions about like inherent lack of capacity in some countries in the world, uh, I don't see why we would harbor those assumptions. But anyway, continuing through it. Um, the last thing that he talks about is immigration. And I'm sure you can imagine that based on his overall perspectives on this other stuff, he's one of those people that says uh, permissive immigration policies are also problematic. In his view, uh, this produces the problem of not sending money and food to the poor people where that would overpopulate their nations, but bringing poor people from the third world to our country. And he thinks that undermines our well-being here. And once again, I don't know if I can, I definitely can't agree with him because this is a nation of immigrants. If you think of the United States unless you're a Native American or an indigenous person, you know, all of us have descendants that came here from other places. So how can we then say that um, the whole concept of immigrants coming from distant corners of the world poses some kind of implied threat to our continued prosperity and survival? I don't agree with that at all, but you know, he says that. Um, and he says <clears throat> that sometimes there are big businesses and special interests that also want to promote permissive immigration policies because they can use the influx of migrant workers for degrading work that some Americans wouldn't be willing to do, like janitorial work or I don't know, et cetera. So um, in the end, he says, many people will condemn his position as being too harsh, overlooking the fact that our country is a nation of immigrants, but he's very tough and he just says, um, that's overly idealistic. He says, if that is your view, then you're just being too, um, idealistic about it. That's not realistic. He says, if you really wanted to be totally just and righteous, 
then wouldn't it be the right thing to just give this country back to Native Americans because there was no moral basis on the transfer of ownership from them to European settlers and colonizers. But nobody, he says, takes seriously the idea of returning the land to the Native Americans. So he says in the end, um, maybe some things that have happened in the past are not fair, but we can't undo them. We can't remake the past. He says we have to move towards the future uh, from where we are today instead of where we would have liked to have been today if things had been more fair and equitable in the past. So he kind of closes with that. He says, until we really do have like a spaceship um, Earth situation where there's like a sovereign leader over the whole planet, then we should operate instead on his chosen metaphor of the lifeboat. So that's kind of his overall argument and everything in it. Um, it took a while, I guess, for me to get through it. So I couldn't really quite get started on the Thompson yet. But I do want to maybe at least say a few things with the last few minutes that we have here about um, Judith Thompson's paper. But in closing, anyway, about Hardin and everything, when I first read Garrett Hardin, I was a college freshman myself. Um, and at first, I listened to his arguments, and I thought some of them were reasonable. But I've, I've changed my perspectives a lot, and I totally disagree with him now. Um, yeah, he um, he's one of those authors that I would say this. He gives an argument that is a little bit more of an intellectually presentable version of some of the heated rhetoric that you see exchanged in like the political arena in, in our um, domestic politics. You know, all this kind of anti-immigrant sentiment and like build a wall and all that stuff. A lot of those arguments and ideas trace back to some of the writings and concepts of people like Garrett Hardin. So it's almost like he's an intellectual architect of many of these um, heated rhetoric and, you know, racial ways of thinking that I think are totally unhelpful. But at the very least, I would say this, if I was a person who found favor with any of those arguments, I would probably rather um, utilize the literature of Hardin than some of the out there and almost insane rhetoric that you see spoken of um, on some of our airwaves. So like it's a more intellectually respectable version of some of those things. But in the end, I think it's not much better um, in terms of the nuts and bolts of the argument itself. There's a lot of gaps in his argument. But anyway, it's not for me to judge. You're the judge. You're a student who can judge these questions on your own. And some people might like what he says. In my view, there's a lot to not like. But it's okay. So anyway, we're moving on. <clears throat> um, so the next author in the series, and this is the last author before we do get to our midterm review sessions that start next um, Wednesday. It's this woman. So this is a woman philosopher of the 20th century, Judith Jarvis Thompson. <laughs> Judith Jarvis Thompson, she uh, was born in 1929, and last I checked, she was still going strong, so she's been around a long time. Uh, this is a paper of hers from 1985, <clears throat> and um, it's called The Trolley Problem. Okay, so The Trolley Problem by Judith Thompson from 1985. Just about Judith Thompson, um, she's she's a really like um, legendary philosopher of the current day. Um, she taught for decades at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and um, she's famous for having a, a lot of interesting writings in the field of ethics, moral philosophy. In 1971, she wrote a classic paper that's become very well known and famous, and it's called A Defense of Abortion. So um, if you know a little bit about the recent history, oh, she just died uh, November 20th, 2020. Sad to hear that. So thanks, Sarah. <clears throat> That's very recent. That was just a few months ago. When I was teaching this same article last semester, I did say that she was still alive. So rest in peace, Judith Thompson. I guess, what is that, 90, 91 years pretty much? So she had a great full life. Um, but yeah, so about Judith Thompson, she wrote this paper, 1971, Defense of Abortion. The Roe versus Wade Supreme Court decision was uh, filed in 1973, and there are a lot of very important academic writings and literature that was uh, leading to that kind of seminal court decision. And so she writes a defense of abortion in 71. That's considered a classic essay. If you ever study ethics in more depth, like if you take a contemporary moral problems class here at Fullerton or wherever, if you read about the abortion topic, which is a common topic in ethics classes, you're always going to read Judith Thompson because her paper is just recognized as being very well written. Um, so she defends the moral permissibility of abortion in that paper, but that's not like even scratching the surface of the topics that she's interested in. This essay has nothing to do with anything about that. It does have a little bit about like killing and letting die, but of course it's not directed at the specific 
scenario of uh, pregnancy. Um, so anyways, trolley problem. The trolley problem is an essay that explores kind of puzzling intuitions that we have about killing versus letting die. What she shows in this paper is that we kind of have mixed up and confused intuitions about killing and letting die. That there are scenarios where we say it would be okay for a person to take an action that would prevent the death of a larger number but cause the death of a smaller number. And a person that's in an audience hearing the scenario generally judges that type of action to be either permissible or impermissible. But when we simply modify some slight aspects of the case, the person gives a different moral reaction. So basically, she's going to show us two different kinds of scenario, and she wants to talk to us about how people generally respond to those two scenarios. Most people who hear these scenarios have a common reaction, either saying that the action of the subject in the example is wrong or not wrong. And as she's going to point out, it is a bit of a puzzle and a problem how to justify these different moral attitudes that we have. They seem to be somewhat inconsistent with each other. Okay, so the trolley problem is an essay that does revolve around the presentation of highly detailed hypothetical scenarios and thought experiments. So we're only going to be able to set this up very briefly now. There's more to say on Monday when we return. But I at least want to talk to you about um, the general kind of example that this essay involves. So it involves a trolley. Here's a trolley. This case we call trolley driver. So just to give it a name, trolley driver. I'm just giving you a visual so you can kind of think about it with the image. So here's a trolley on a track going forward. Inside the trolley, you have this driver of the trolley. Here he is with the steering mechanism. There's a problem, though, big problem. Ahead of him on this trolley track, there's five people. Five people are on that track, and that's not good because this trolley is headed straight toward him. And on its current trajectory, it's going to kill all five of them when it plows into them. Now, um, <clears throat> you wish you could hit the brakes or something and stop the trolley short before it goes towards them and hits them. But unfortunately, the brakes are not working right now. So it looks like nothing can be done. But there is one thing that actually can be done. You see, there's a fork in the trolley so that if you switch the tracks, you can divert it from its current path to this other tangent. And then it doesn't hit those five people. That's awesome, right? Because now he has a switch that he can hit that will divert it onto the other stretch of track. So he's going to, you would think, do that, and that's good. But unfortunately, though, there is one person up there on that track. So here's the state of play. If this trolley continues on its path and he does not hit the switch, the trolley is going to smack into five people and kill them all. If he hits the switch, though, the trolley will move on the other stretch and it'll still kill one person, but it won't kill five there, okay? Now, he's the only person who can have this, who has access to the switch. And let me just say this, because sometimes people hear the scenario and you start thinking all these side thoughts, like, well, why don't they just move off the track? Or like, you know, but they can't, okay? It's a hypothetical scenario, so we've already controlled for that. They're just on the tracks and don't ask why, but they can't go away from them. So it's basically like you're locked in. The trolley can't be stopped. It's going to hit five or it's going to hit one. So I'm going to let you guys go, but I just have one question before I let you go. Just hit me with a quick answer. If this trolley driver flips the switch, is that okay? Or do you think it's wrong for him to flip the switch? Wrong or not wrong to divert it to the less populated track. So it will not kill five and instead just kill one. That's the question. And that's the survey question that thousands and thousands of people have been asked because this scenario has been presented in all these research institutions to test people's moral intuitions. David, you're saying not wrong. And I'll tell you, you're in good company, so don't stress about your reaction because that's almost the universal reaction of everybody. Um, well, Derek, I mean, then, then, then there's Derek. Uh, but no, almost everybody, so if I'm not just not, – not, not just my opinion. If you actually look at the reaction of actual survey groups, it's um, almost – it's in the high 90s. People say it's not wrong. And Derek, I wonder why you say that because he's already involved. He's involved. He's the driver of the trolley. If he hits these five people, he's accountable for the death of five. So isn't it better if he hits fewer people? I mean, we're talking about human lives here. These are people with families, friends, dreams, hopes for the future. I mean, imagine it was someone that you knew. Do you really want five people to die instead of one? I'm just trying to play with you a little so that you can kind of see how, uh, how most everybody thinks about it, if that makes any sense. But we have more to say on it, okay? So can he not just pump the brakes like I told you, Sarah? No, he can't. That's not happening. The brakes are not working right now. So I'm sorry, Sarah, someone's going to die. It's either going to be five or it's going to be one. And it's sort of like... 
most people think that when he tries to divert it to the less, you know, where there's only one, he's simply trying to avoid the greater loss of life. We're talking death and destruction here. Five dead people is horrible. One is also bad, of course. Anybody dying by means of a trolley hitting him is a tragedy. But this is more and this is less, and the numbers seem to matter, at least to most people. So that's why most people don't think it's wrong. But we're just getting to the very beginning of this essay. There's a lot more in it. So hold tight, and then on Monday we'll finish it up. But for now, I guess, uh, I'll be in touch with you over the weekend with a study guide and with the information about when I finish grading your first essay. Um, so that's coming up soon. In between now and then, I guess, just have a really solid weekend. If you need anything, uh, email me anytime, and I'll be uh, available. So let me know that we're all good and that you're good to go, and then I'll just close our stream. Sorry, I had to hit you with an example right at the end, but that was just part of uh, the timing, I guess. So thanks again, everyone. Have a good one, and uh, take care. I'll be in touch. All right, bye-bye.